You know what, folks? Everybody likes a big locomotive. I mean, come on. I got to ride on the Union Pacific Big Boy last year, but you know what? Let me tell you, there's something to be said for the small guys as well. We have got an incredibly neat, small locomotive restoration project we're going to be talking about. It's Trains Live. Come on along. It's Trains Live. I'm Bob Lettenberger, Associate Editor for Trains Magazine. And, well, you know what? We're not talking big today. We're going small. If you think about some of the locomotive restoration projects that we've seen in the United States over the past few years, Union Pacific, 4014, big boy. Big, big locomotive. No two ways around it. How about... 1309, the Baldwin locomotive that's now running at the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad. Again, a big articulated locomotive. How about Norfolk and Western number 611, a big passenger locomotive. And as much as the big locomotives are cool and make a lot of noise and they're fun to watch and they've got neat stories behind them, something's got to be said for the small guys too. So let me tell you what, a few weeks ago, a press release floats across my desk, and it's from a group called the American Industrial Railroad Society. And I'm thinking, okay, what's the story here? Well, today in the short line world, we often hear the phrase first mile, last mile, meaning that a short line carrier picks up goods for that first mile of transport hands them off to a larger carrier for the bulk of the trip and then maybe hands them back to another short line for that last mile of the trip. But short, short distances, first mile, last mile, have again become very important in small railroad transportation. Well, guess what, folks? It's always been that way. And the story that we want to talk about today, this small locomotive with the American Industrial Railroad Society, well, it's just that. It's old time, first mile, last mile, small railroading. I want to bring in the president of AIRS, the American Industrial Railroad Society. Sam Offmuth is with us today. Sam, welcome to Trains Live. Thanks for so much for having me today, today here, Bob. You know, as I was saying there in the open, the, the press release about your organization floats across the desk, and I'm kind of looking at it going, what, what is this? What is this? And then I read, and man, I'll tell you, you guys, you guys got a cool mission and a, and a cool uh, project going on, a neat restoration. So I think let's start with this. Explain for folks what is the American Industrial Railroad Society. What's your mission? What are you doing? So AIRS was founded with the mission of primarily bringing together everybody who's interested in not only the modern role that industrial railroads play uh, in the railroading network, but also the historical role that they played in the development of our nation. So we were founded to bring groups of those people together, but around that idea, we purchased the Indiana Northern Number no. 4, and very small, slope-back tendered 040 locomotive that was completely disassembled sitting outside a depot in Alito, Illinois. And we got together and said, we understand this, this locomotive's got a really unique story past, staying just one step ahead of the torch. And we didn't want the story to end there outside that depot. So we reached out to the estate that owns the number four and we worked out a deal. And next thing you know, we were the proud owners of a 1913 Baldwin. Cool, okay, so we got a locomotive. And we are going to restore it, and I'm, I'm beginning to see the picture of why. But delve a little bit for me into that history. Um, you know, this idea of small industrial railroads. Um, you know, let's go back to the the early 1900s. In fact, if I remember right, and correct me if I'm wrong, number four dates back to 1913. What what does small industrial railroading look like in 1913? So. Way back in the early 1900s, industrial railroading was just as varied, if not more varied than it is today. You had uh, small railroads weaving their way in and out of 
blooming industrial landscapes as well as tucked away hidden in the wildernesses of North America. So you really could have a, a really quite varied description of what these railroads were not only pulling and, and hauling, but also doing as well. So number four itself came through a industrial park in South Bend, Indiana. The Oliver Child Plow Works was the birthplace of the Indiana Northern Railroad. Uh, in the early 1890s, they had gotten fed up with the service that the railroads at that time were providing them, not only in uh, poor service, slow shipping times and delays, but also with the, the prices they were charging as well and the shipping tariffs at that time. So the founder of the Oliver Schild Plow Company sat down and they created their own industrial railroad to switch their own cars. But it grew to be more than that because they ha also had a number of industries and businesses surrounding the plow works at that time. And very quickly, the railroad grew to service those industries and businesses as well. And it, the railroad really took off. Uh, so it's really amazing just how small and niche you can get with these little railroads and just how many of them there were at the time in the big picture that they fit into. You know, everything you just said there, Sam, sounds exactly like something that you could read on Trains.com Newswire in the last week, the last eight weeks, or, you know, over the last summer. It's like history has, has repeated itself here. <laughs> I mean, I'm hearing, you know, better service, better rates, um, you know, the, the convenience of having your own railroad. And, it, it, yeah, it's like what goes around comes around almost. <laughs> It's, it's an age-old problem that predates even the railroads themselves. Okay. And also, I, I'm, I've, got a, I've got something in my mind here. I want to make sure I clear this up. Like when you say the Oliver Chilled Plow Company, is that the same organization that ended up building um, the green Oliver farm tractors? I believe so, yes. Okay. All right. Okay. So so we have industry that they're they're basically fed up with the big guys and you know yeah in northern indiana it makes sense i mean it was a hotbed of uh, vehicle manufacturing i think if i remember right um, one of the other places that the railroad served was the the studebaker um, automobile factory there in south bend so yeah you, know, you can see where there's enough business for a little railroad to to make it go absolutely so um Okay, so we've got the, the locomotive, we've got some interesting history. Uh, it's, you know, like short lines today, you know, there's folks that, that pay attention to specific short lines. There's a, there's a lot of uh, photographic interest because it's, you know, equipment that you probably would not see out on some of the big class ones. Um, and we've got this, you know, this neat little locomotive. Now, your group that is working on this, there is also something that has, has struck me about them. In fact, the first time I saw a picture of them, um, it seems like you guys have got a heck of a youth movement uh, going. In fact, can, if I can ask, how old are you? I'm 23. You... <laughs> time out, hold on, hold on. 23? 23. <laughs> 23. 23, I know it's crazy. <laughs> oh my God. And you are leading an organization that is going to restore a steam locomotive. We're going to talk about the condition that number four is in when you guys got it in just a minute. But how many, let, let's, let's, let's go this way. How many folks in your organization are 40 plus? About four of them. About four. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then, currently our membership's made up of about 15 to 18, and four of those are, are in the 40 Up Club. Man, I'll tell you what, you, you, get, you get a round of applause from me right here, right now for that. That, Sam, that youth movement is just incredible on, on so many levels. And I, I, I can't even begin to imagine the takeaways that your group is getting not only from you know the the idea of working on a historic project, um, but also just the the skills that um, you're using in restoring this piece of equipment that are going to be so valuable in in later life. So I mean, right? You you guys have sold me right here with the youth movement thing. All right, <laughs> I'm on board. Incredible, incredible. How? With such a youth movement, though, 
How are you guys working through the restoration of uh, a steam locomotive? I mean, Sam, if you're 23, um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll admit, I'm 59 years old. Steam locomotives were gone a few years before I was born. They were gone decades before you were born. How is this group working with this idea of a technology that is, you know, is a couple generations before them? I would say that most of the people in our organization have a long time fascination with the machine to begin with. So having that interest already has really, really helped us. Uh, but it's also important to remember that outside of our group, we've received a lot of advice and a lot of help and a lot of know-how from people who aren't our age, but who are also involved or tangentially involved in a number of projects that are currently going on. So we may average about 28 or 29, but it's important to remember that there's a lot more people with a lot more experience who are involved than just us. Even being so young, we have a lot of people. Uh, myself, I'm a professional welder, uh, formerly of the Strasburg Railroad, and uh, we have professional railroads, professional professional railroaders, professional machinists, we have teachers, we have a lawyer, we just have a very varied group of people who are currently involved. And it's amazing to see so many people of different backgrounds come together around the common goal of this locomotive. Fantastic. You guys now have also, you know, here, here's the second checkbox. Not only have you got a organization with youth and vitality and interest, but now you have also uh, ticked off the positions to show that, that hey, AIRS is a solid organization. We've thought through what we are doing. We have the right uh, professional disciplines in place to help us and to, to move us forward. And like you said, your skills as a, a welder alone at the age of 23, I'm still blown away by this. This is just wow. But you've got a solid foundation, which tells me that with that third checkbox, getting the right funding, you guys are gonna have some success down the road here. This is, this is exciting. So, um, so we've, we've got the locomotive, and I guess, Sam, let's jump ahead. What's the ultimate? What's the ultimate plan? You get it restored. Um, what happens then? So once the locomotive is restored, the thing about it is that it's big enough to do a lot of work, but it's small enough to still fit on a semi truck. Our ultimate desire with this engine was not to be really restrained by any interchange or shipping policies by current day railroads. And with the size of the number four, that'll allow us to move the locomotive around to various museums and short line railroads across the country just like that. We're not going to be limited by shipping restraints or interchange policies, like I said. And that'll also be a double-edged sword that'll allow us to share, you know, the industrial railroads history, as well as the steam locomotive, an operational one, with a lot of museums and places that haven't had one before or at least not in a very long time and we want to use that oh, yes. to our advantage to spread the rope spread the word absolutely what um how much does the locomotive weigh how much are we talking about moving around well keep in mind that the locomotive splits into two pieces the mm -hmm. tender and the engine but i believe it was scaled leaving baldwin at about eighty thousand pounds okay all right not not bad not bad and you know your idea of being able to take it to uh, a short line a museum um you know an event of some kind around a railroad and to be able to share and then yeah move on along Boy, there, there, there are so many advantages to being able to do that. And, you know, as, as you and I both know, and you guys have probably seen and can't wait for the day, but steam locomotives are an attraction. And, you know, from the, the, you know, the young who are experiencing it from the first time to, to older folks who are using them as a mirror or a window to see, you know, what the, the past was like for them. Boy, to, to see a different locomotive come in and, come in in the method and the, the, the program, the plan that you're talking about, um, wow, fantastic idea. And, and that's, that would be a refreshing look. And yeah, it cuts out a lot of, uh, a lot of bumps in the road, if you will, for you folks along the way. Um, where are you right now in the, the restoration? 
So right now we've currently relocated the entire engine and we've been plucking away at doing a full inventory of all the pieces that make the engine up. Despite having been taken about as far apart as it could be taken and then moved around three states across three decades, it's still about 85% complete, which is hard to believe because okay. when you take an engine apart like that, the first thing you do is lose parts. Oh yeah. So, yeah. so beyond that, we're also continuing ultrasound uh, inspections on the boiler as well as other parts of the locomotive. But our biggest project that we're doing to date is the restoration of the locomotive's cab. Okay. All right. And that, if I remember right, the cab was was in pretty tough shape and you're, are you able to salvage any or are we talking a, a significant or a complete rebuild? So the cab, believe it or not, the whole engine really looked in bad shape, but it's got very <laughs> strong bones. And that was something that we were just so pleased to find out. The further we dig into this, we realize just how strong it is at the core. And the cab's the same way. So we've got some metal to replace, uh, such as the rain gutters, some metal patches at the bottom of the cab where it had rotted and rusted all the way through. But really, the, the amount of work that is involved in the cab isn't unheard of and isn't overwhelming either. We've budgeted about $6,000 to bring the entire cab back to ready-for-service status. So by the time we're done with this, it'll be ready to be used as a display, as a showpiece to show what we're trying to do here some of what the locomotive is going to look like when we're finished with it and just really use it as a big motivational piece for for ourselves and our supporters as well <laughs> I, I like that as a motivational piece for yourselves i mean what what better to show that next step of progress going you know guys guess what we we did this let's let's look at some other stuff i also like your your comment about um using it as a showpiece to to you know help educate folks let them know what you're doing um i ran into your crew at train fest um in milwaukee here this last fall um so are we going to see the cab at a future train fest <laughs> uh that's the hope okay all right that that would be that would be very interesting. That'd be very interesting. So, okay, you said about six thousand dollars on the cab. Um, how are you guys situated for funding for that little portion of the project right now? Right now, we have over four thousand dollars of that rate, so we're well over two thirds of the of the way there. But uh, we're still continuing to accept donations for that purpose, and we will happily use them for exactly for what we say they'll be used for. They'll be going right into the cab. Fantastic. You know, and that's another thing that, that looking at your website that um, is, I, I think, is a very good thing that you are doing. You, you've you broken this project down into to these little bitty bites. And, you know, hey, folks, now we're working on the cab. Here's what we've got to do. Here's what it's going to take. Can you help us with the cab? Um, as opposed to we're restoring this whole steam locomotive and you know, we need X to fulfill our budget. Um, taking it in those little bites, um, showing the progress, it, it makes it so much more manageable, not only for you guys, but for the for the general public. And I hope you're seeing success with that. Right. It's, it's really difficult to think about sometimes, but when you walk in, even a locomotive as small as the number four, it can be really daunting, especially when you see it taken apart and you can see just how much work there still is to do. And so when you can take a step back and look at it and say, we're going to make these check marks, we're going to have these these waypoints that we're going to go through. And at the end of it, if we can stay to it, we'll have a complete working 1913 Baldwin <laughs> steam engine uh, all the way back in original paint scheme, too. Original paint scheme. What are we what are we talking? I, I sense by you going there, we're not talking black and and graphite on the smoke box. We've got something else in mind. Yes, actually. So number four presented us with a unique opportunity historically. And the fact is that it operated for nearly 50 years from 1913 to the space age in the early 1960s. And uh, like many locomotives over that time period, it earned itself a, a very proper black coat. But it's important to remember that back around that time period that the number four was built, if you wanted a black locomotive from Baldwin Locomotive Works, you had to tell them that's what you wanted. Otherwise, it was being delivered in their stock Baldwin green color. Oh, okay. So we've actually had the opportunity to do color matching to original Baldwin green samples, and we will be using that exact color 
uh, and as well as details that are called out for on the specification card for this engine's construction, and we'll be matching every one of those details to make it the correct factory new appearance. It'll be the first time number fours looked like this in well over 100 years. Wow. Baldwin Records and Plans, uh, how, how has it been for you folks in finding information that is valid to your locomotive? How, how has the research process gone? It's actually quite surprising how much is still around because when you think about such a small locomotive on such a small railroad in such a big wide world, and out of the tens of thousands of engines that Baldwin built, that there's still quite a bit around, including the specification cards, which call out every last detail from boiler construction to the paint to the lettering that'll be put on the locomotive. It really goes into minute detail, and that really helps us out. Neat, neat. Good stuff. Good. Hey, tell you what, we're going to step over to Mr. Bob's railroad bookcase for just a moment. Sam, hang out. We're going to come back in just a minute. Like we always do, some books that you can do some further research. And one of the ones, and I've had this in front of me because I've been kind of referencing it, um, from our library here at Kalmbach, we have a reprint of the Baldwin Locomotive Works Catalog of Locomotives. This one dates to 1915. And this is, this is going to be one that if you're looking for this, you're going to have to do a little, little digging for it. We're talking museum, used bookshop, maybe a, a good uh, train book dealer. But what's cool about this in the front here, and now remember, when I say catalog, this is kind of like you going into a car dealer today and saying, I want to buy a car. This is, this is Baldwin's wares for this particular year. So in the front, we have all of their information, the specs about their locomotives, um, you know, tractive force and hauling capacity, superheating, all the things that make a Baldwin locomotive fantastic. And you read through this and yeah, they, they give you some good information, but they're selling locomotives here, folks. You're in a catalog. Of course, I had to look and see, can I find number four? And number four, 040, and we've, here it is, the standard gauge 04 locomotive. And I'm looking, and, and Sam and I were talking about this before we, we uh, came on air here today. Baldwin for 1915 didn't have just one 040. There's actually about uh, 15 different 040s listed, different models. And, you know, today you can get a pickup truck with various option packages, so on and so forth. Well, here you can choose your tractive effort. Um, for 1915, Baldwin made 040s with a slope back tender ranging from 5,340 pounds of tractive effort all the way up to 24,620 pounds of tractive effort. And they have a name for each one of those uh, particular models. And something that I want to find out with Sam later on is if we can identify what model that they actually have there in number four. So the 1915 Baldwin Locomotive Works catalog, one you're going to have to look for a little bit, but it's going to be a good one. Um, if you are looking more for history of Baldwin, the business side, come their, their processes, um, how the business evolved, the Baldwin Locomotive Works, 1831 to 1915, or, yep, 1915 um, a just solid history book. Um, a lot of great photographs showing uh, the erecting bays, um, a, a very good story talking about uh, Baldwin and its history and how it developed uh, locomotives. So that one, the Baldwin Locomotive Works, 1831 to 1915, um, probably a good library book, also a good used bookstore find, but a great one for the history of Baldwin. Last one on the bookshelf today, actually last two on the bookshelf today, we have just Baldwin Locomotives. This one is by author Brian Solomon, um, who does write for Kalmbach Media. He has dozens and dozens of very good train books out there. Um, Solomon, in his writing here, uh, uses a lot of uh, very good illustrations to tell the story of Baldwin. He mixes in a bit of history, also a bit of uh, technical information 
on the various locomotives that were developed um, by the Baldwin Works. Um, this one, a more recent publication, uh, library for sure, good reputable bookstore, Baldwin Locomotives, Brian Solomon, the author on that. Last one on the bookshelf today, going to reach way down toward the back here. Another one just titled Baldwin Locomotives. And this book, unlike the other two, takes a little different approach to telling the Baldwin story. This one is more, um, I don't want to say 30,000 foot looking down, but maybe say 10 to 15,000 feet. There's a lot of good detail. There is a lot of technical detail looking at some of the little innovations that made Baldwin locomotives very good. In the back, kind of a summation uh, of the specifications, sort of like the catalog. And then, of course, also some great pictures uh, of some of the actual assemblies and parts and pieces of the locomotives uh, being made at the Baldwin factory. So, Baldwin Locomotives, Baldwin, um, one of the big locomotive builders uh, in our country. Uh, we say big, yet they had the capability of producing a small locomotive like number four. Plenty of great research about that. Sam, bring you back in here for just a moment. You guys have got a great, great program going, and I wish you the best of luck. And um, if somebody does want to help out, either financially or maybe they want to come and get their hands dirty, um, first off, financially, how, how can somebody help you guys out that way? So uh, we have a number of ways to donate through our website. We accept PayPal as well as other credit card donations. Uh, key to our mission is also accepting donations of things such as historical books and other artifacts related to industrial railroads. Tools, of course, are always needed in a locomotive restoration. But of course, <laughs> money is what makes the wheels go round. So sure. we, of course, would appreciate a donation to help us close the gap towards the $6,000 for our cab, as well as any other projects that are going to be, need to be done for the number four. All right. And uh, say I want to come roll up my sleeves and get into some grease and, and do some manual labor. Are you looking for volunteers to help as well? We are always look to, looking for new volunteers and are excited to welcome new volunteers into our organization. Uh, if you visit our website, www.industrialrails.org, go to the membership and volunteering tab and fill out the form, contact us via email, and we'll get back to you to answer your questions and send you a membership application as well. All right, fantastic. Sam Offmuth, the president of the American Industrial Railroad Society, they are working on restoring Baldwin Locomotive Number no. 4, a small 040 uh, from the Northern Indiana Railroad, um, a whole different aspect of railroading that we normally don't think about. Sam, thanks so much for your time today. Um, we're going to check back within you with in in with you on a regular basis, check on the progress, see how you guys are doing. So. Thanks so much for having me today, Bob. You're welcome. Hey, folks, KambachHobbyStore.com. KambachHobbyStore.com. Dial that up. Um, all your hobby needs. Books, good railroad books, the latest books from Kalmbach Media. You can find them there. Hey, that's going to wrap up Trains Live for today. I want to see you on Trains.com real soon. And I'll tell you what, the next time I see a copy of Trains Magazine, I'd love to see you behind it. Thanks for joining us on Trains Live.